And we perceive these different sensations because of particular types of neurons. You can call the company, they'll refund you. All right, so we're going to talk about the different types of neurons that help us to perceive different types of sensations. So we'll talk about your ability to perceive taste, smell, vision, hearing, and so on. Now, when we talk about these particular types of neurons, a lot of times people will refer to neurons as receptors. So when I use the term sensory receptor, it really means these are sensory neurons. They're able to perceive different types of sensations. There's two major categories of sensory neurons. There are enteroreceptors, and then there are exteroreceptors. If a neuron is in the category of an enteroreceptor, this is a type of neuron that can tell us about things that are going on inside the body. So helps us to perceive pain, helps us to perceive pressure, helps us to tell if our blood pressure is changing, helps us to tell if there's something wrong with the inside of our knee, that type of thing. Exteroreceptors are helping us to perceive sensations on the outside of the body. So if you're hearing things, if you are looking and seeing things, taste and smell, these are all things that come from the outside and affect the body. So intero on the inside, extero on the outside of the body. So if we're talking about very specific types of neurons or very specific types of sensory receptors, there's one type I want you to know about called a chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptors are responsible mainly for our ability to taste things and to smell. So we'll talk about chemoreceptors today and how they work because we're going to discuss how we taste things, how we smell things. Another type of sensory receptor is called a photoreceptor. Okay? So chemoreceptors for taste and smell. A photoreceptor is for vision, helps us to see light. We have mechanoreceptors also. These are specialized neurons that help us to know where our body is at. Okay? So you know where your foot is right now compared to your nose. And sometimes your mechanoreceptors are all messed up and people can't tell where their foot or their nose is. That's a big problem. But as long as you know that, you, your mechanoreceptors are working fine. We have thermal receptors. Those help us to tell temperature. So it helps our body to know how hot or how cold things are. As a matter of fact, all of us have different numbers of thermal receptors. So some people will have more thermal receptors that detect cold. Some people will have more thermal receptors to detect heat. So for instance, if you have more thermal receptors that detect heat, you probably don't like living in the high desert during the summer because the heat super affects you. You're massively affected by it. If you had more thermal receptors that detected cold, maybe you're a kind of person who doesn't like the snow because you're super affected by the cold. So everybody has a different amount of thermal receptors that allows us to tell hot from cold. So what has to happen with every kind of neuron, especially these sensory neurons, we have to have what's called transduction.
perception is the ability to take any kind of sensory information, like you put candy in your mouth. And we're going to take that information and turn it into neurological information the brain understands. So the neurons help to take that sweet flavor, whatever it may be, and convert it into neurological information. And the brain goes, oh, OK, I know what that is. I know what's going on. So this is what transduction means. Three other types of neurons I'd like you to know about. One is called a proprioceptor. Another is a cutaneous neuron or cutaneous receptor. And then we have pain receptors. Now, a proprioceptor. These are neurons that help you when you're moving the body. And they specifically let you know where your body is in space. So if you were asked to close your eyes and touch your nose, you'd be able to do it because proprioceptors are able to detect where your hands are, where your nose is located. So proprioception is knowing where your body is in space. Cutaneous means skin. So these are receptors that are in your skin that help you to feel things. So help you to feel if somebody's tickling you, help you to feel if somebody's hitting you a little bit harder with some pressure, or maybe with very light touch. You've got different types of receptors or different types of neurons in your skin that helps you to perceive different bits of information. And then you have pain receptors. Of all the different types of neurons we have in our body, the pain ones are the ones that we have the most of. It just doesn't seem quite right why we would have so many pain receptors. But why do we have so many pain receptors? Survival. Yeah, survival. Okay? So, for instance, there are some children who genetically are born without any pain receptors. They have none. These kids usually don't last to the age of two. Because if you think about it, they don't know what pain is. Uh, there's a family that I know, their daughter was born without any pain receptors. It's a very rare genetic disease, but she had it. And right around the age of two, she was outside playing with her two older brothers. And they weren't much older than her, just four and five. And whatever happened, she ran into the garage door and they started laughing. So of course she thought it was funny too, because it didn't hurt. So she ran head first into the garage door again. And again, and again, and again until she killed herself because she didn't feel any pain. So how would she know that this is bad for you? Uh, people who have the disease of leprosy, this is a bacterial infection that causes the person's pain receptors to die. So you and I know if you're using a knife and you're cutting something and you accidentally cut your finger, you stop immediately because it hurts. You don't keep cutting. But what if I didn't have any pain receptors? and I cut my finger and didn't know that I was doing it. I could really mutilate myself pretty bad, which is exactly what happens to people with leprosy. They usually become pretty mutilated because it's things that they're doing to themselves all the time. They lose limbs, you know, they hit their face when they're not supposed to, and then they hit it over and over again, or shaving, they don't know when not to dig the skin off their face because it just, it doesn't hurt. They don't know their limits. So we have so many pain receptors because it helps us to survive and to keep us healthy. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Proprial receptors are in every muscle in our body. So for instance, if you look at this region in the leg, okay? you have proprioceptors in the muscle itself. These are specialized neurons that are attached to the muscle so that anytime the muscle moves, it sends information to the brain to say, hey, the arm just moved and it's out here now, or it's up there now. It's doing some movement, and now these proprioceptors can tell the brain where exactly the body parts have moved to. So they're in every single one of our muscles.
So we have different types of cutaneous receptors. So this is some skin, and we'll talk about this later on. Uh, but skin has multiple different types of receptors, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize any of these. Uh, but I'll tell you, you've got things like Merkel's discs. Uh, you've got Krauss's bulbs. You have Meisner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, Ruffinian endings. You'll have to memorize these when you get into anatomy. Each one of them does something different. So, for instance, a Pacinian corpuscle, uh, this is for deep pressure. So if something presses really hard on your skin, you can feel it. Uh, a Meisner's corpuscle, this is for more light touch. Also, a lot of people, their Meisner's corpuscles are very sensitive to certain kinds of touch, and we call it tickling. Okay, so each of these different types of cutaneous receptors has a different function. These right here, they're called free nerve endings, and those are mostly for pain. Okay, and they're all found in this lower layer of the skin. Okay, so let's talk about the sense of taste, and then we'll get into smell. somebody's tongue, typically on the tip of the tongue we're able to smell or to taste things that are sweet. We have on the tongue chemoreceptors, these are specialized neurons that are able to pick up different chemicals from the foods that we eat. So there are special chemoreceptors in what we would call our taste buds. These have neurons in them. And these neurons are in particular going to be able to pick up sweet tastes. On the back of the tongue, this is typically where people can taste bitter tastes. So this would be like caffeine, nicotine, uh, even some poisons have a bitter taste. Now by the way, towards the back of the tongue is also our gag reflex. So a lot of people think that we taste bitter on the back of the tongue so that if we're swallowing something that's a poison, it helps us to gag it up and get rid of it quicker. Okay? Now some people genetically, they can't taste bitter. Uh, and if you can't taste bitter, you're much more likely to not like vegetables. It's very interesting because if you can't taste bitter most of the time, you can't taste a variety of vegetables that are out there. They have a lot of the bitter chemicals in them, and it makes them unappetizing for people. On the sides of the tongue, we have specialized chemoreceptors that help us to taste things that are sour, and then also to help us to taste things that are salty. Now that's just a rough sketch of where we taste these things because everybody's a little bit different. Some people will even taste like sweet things here. Some people can even taste sour things like in their cheeks. We actually, some people actually have chemoreceptors in their cheeks and can taste sour or maybe even in the back of their throat. So everybody's a little bit different, but this is basically where the different tastes are located. Now, if you look at somebody's tongue from the side, okay, and you could look at it microscopically, you'd see that there are these little pits on the surface of the tongue. And coming out of these little pits, it almost looks like there's these little hairs, but they're attached to the neurons. So these are the dendrites that are protruding in these little pits. These are the taste buds. So any foods that we eat, the chemicals go across the surface of the tongue and then they fall into these little pits and they stimulate the chemoreceptors. Now we only have four different basic types of taste. We can taste the bitter and the salty, the sour and the sweet. Those are our four types of taste. So anything we eat is going to stimulate only those four tastes. So let's say you're eating something that's chocolate. Maybe it's a dark chocolate. It's going to incorporate some of the sweet, maybe some of the bitter, 
and you'll be able to figure out the brain will say, oh yeah, I've tasted this before, it's dark chocolate. Or maybe you're tasting something that's like salted caramel. You're going to be able to use chemoreceptors that pick up salty. You're going to use chemoreceptors that pick up sweet. And because you've tasted this before, the brain will go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's salted caramel. But what if you never tasted something before? So what if you've never eaten alligator? And you eat alligator for the very first time. And somebody says, what does alligator taste like? What do you think you might say? Chicken? Yeah, we hear that a lot. Tastes like chicken. I've tasted alligator before. Anybody else tasted alligator? Nobody? Okay. Well, it doesn't taste like chicken. And if you ask me what it tastes like, I, could, I couldn't even begin to tell you. Because, in my opinion, it doesn't taste like anything else I've ever eaten. So one of the problems is... When we learn about food, so as a little kid, you know, somebody shoves a spoon in your mouth and tells you, hey, you're eating peas, or, okay, have some carrots, and they're shoving this into your mouth as a baby. Your brain starts to learn, oh, that taste is carrots, or, oh, that taste is ice cream. And you learn to associate what a person told you with that taste. Now what happens when you taste something you've never tasted before and there's no way to associate it with anything? It's very difficult to describe it. It's almost like, how would you describe the color blue to someone who's been blind all their life? Think about that. How difficult is that going to be? What would you do? How would you describe the color blue to someone who's always been blind? They have no idea what color it is. going to take a lot of imagination, huh? Yeah. You might say things like, well, the color blue, certain blue is like uh, cold. Or maybe certain blue is like water. You'd have to associate it with something that they felt or tasted or smelled before. Use other sensations for them. But it's not going to be the same as if you were to describe it to somebody who has sight. So, our brain is able to associate tastes once we've learned them as well. But we only have four different types of taste neurons. The salty, sweet, sour, bitter. And it's a combination of those that helps us to taste all the different things that we know. So the sense of taste is also referred to as gustation. The sense of smell is olfaction. And about 80% of what we taste is actually what we smell. And you already know that, okay? So what happens if you've got a really, really bad cold? How well can you taste your food? Yeah, you pretty much can't, okay? So about 80 to 90% of everything we taste actually comes from our sense of smell. Very important. Now, the olfactory neurons are found way up in the nose. So like in the bridge of the nose, kind of a little bit deeper than where you would touch with your fingers here, we have all the neurons for smell. So this is what we're looking at here, right in this area. This is where all the neurons for smell are located. And you can see these are the neurons right here. And these little things that kind of look like little hairs or fingers sticking out, those are the dendrites. And the chemicals that we smell go up into the nose and they bind to these dendrites and stimulate these olfactory neurons. And then that information goes to the brain. This region of the brain right here where it picks up the chemicals that we smell is called the olfactory bulb. Now we're going to be looking at some brains a little bit later on in lab, and so you'll get to see the olfactory bulb, or I'll bring them out in this class and I'll show them to you later. 
So anything that we smell, like this rose here, those chemicals are going to go up into the nasal area here and then bind to these neurons for olfaction. And you can see, again, these are the ones that are blown up. And then those neurons carry information through the base of our skull. There's little tiny holes in the base of our skull. And that information goes to the olfactory bulb. And then it's carried to which part of the brain is for smelling? Starts with a U. The uncus. The uncus. So the olfactory bulb carries this information to the uncus. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is these little cells in between. These cells in between, these olfactory neurons, these are stem cells. Now, we've talked a little bit about stem cells already. What do stem cells have the ability to do? They can turn into anything, can't they? Well, these are interesting stem cells. We talked about the fact that neurons are amitotic. What does that mean again? They can't divide. You can't make a new neuron from an old one. They have no ability to divide. But that's kind of sort of a little bit of a lie because these neurons, um, it's believed that we can use these stem cells and produce new neurons in the nose about once every two months. So about every 60 days, you get brand new neurons in the nose all the time. Those stem cells are able to produce new neurons. So no other neurons have this ability. They don't have any stem cells that can't reproduce. So scientists started messing with these stem cells. And one of the things they found is if you take the stem cells out of a person's nose and put them in a Petri dish and just leave them in this Petri dish, they will immediately begin to turn into a neuron on their own. Don't have to do anything with them. Don't have to add in chemicals, nothing. They just, on their own, turn into a neuron. So they're like, hmm, this is really cool. So I wonder, if we have a person who, let's say, has brain damage, and some of the neurons in their brain have died, could we take some of these stem cells out of their nose and plant them into their brain, and would they automatically turn into new neurons and start healing the brain? And the answer to that is yes. And there are huge studies all over the world right now on how to appropriately plant these stem cells from somebody's nose into their brain and get that brain growing again and producing new neurons and healing that person's brain. So imagine you have somebody who, let's say, has a stroke and the neurons in their brain die and you can just harvest some cells from their nose, plant it back into their brain, and it's as if they didn't have a stroke anymore. Or you have somebody whose spinal cord is severed in half, you could plant these neurons into their spinal cord, they would, or these stem cells, they'd grow into neurons and now they're not uh, quadriplegic, they're not paralyzed from the neck down anymore. That's pretty cool stuff. But these are the only stem cells in the body that we know of that will automatically, without any help, nothing needed, turn directly into neurons. Any questions about this? Okay, now sometimes um, people will have problems or diseases that are associated with the olfactory neurons. And one of those diseases is called anosmia. And anosmia means that this person doesn't have any sense of smell. Now it could be caused by a number of things. So for instance, maybe somebody has had an injury to their brain and the brain isn't able to perceive smell anymore. So you don't know you're smelling anything. Even though the nose is working fine, the brain isn't, so you may be smelling something, but you just don't even know you're doing it. Or you could have somebody who has really bad allergies, and their nose is very swollen inside, and the chemicals can't get up to the olfactory neurons, and you just can't smell anything. 
So anosmia could be something that's wrong with the nose, it could be something that's wrong with the brain, but the person has no sense of smell. Now because 80 to 90 percent of what you taste is actually smell, this leads to something called agesia. And now the person has no ability to taste anything. So if you have anosmia, you probably have agesia as well. <clears throat> what if they didn't have agesia? Could they still taste? Well, if 80 to 90 percent of what you taste actually comes from smell, then you could taste very little. There's one other that's really interesting. This problem is called uncinate fits. And uncinate fits are hallucinations of smell. Now the really bad thing about this is that the hallucinations are typically negative hallucinations that the person has. You normally, when you, for instance, smell a rose, you think it smells like dog poop. It's not going to be, if you smell dog poop, you think it smells like a rose. And this is almost always due to brain damage. So uh, when I was in school, I had a friend who, uh, we were in med school together, and he got into an automobile accident. He was riding his motorcycle, and a truck in front of him slammed on his brakes too hard, and just a whole string of bad luck for this guy. His helmet strap that he had, the helmet he had on, the strap broke, and as he went flying off of his motorcycle, his helmet went flying off in the other direction. When he landed, he landed on the ball hitch of a truck in front of him, and it embedded into his brain, through the temporal lobe, into the uncus. Luckily for him, he was very close to Loma Linda, so they were able to rush him to the hospital. They had to take out a massive part of his brain. And one of the many problems that he had after that is he had uncinate fits. Now, it took him several years of therapy to kind of get back up and going again. And he did come back to school after a couple years. And uh, he was talking to a professor one day. And I happened to notice, because he was acting really weird, and you could tell as he's talking to this professor, he looks like he's going to get sick. You know, he's sort of turning green and not looking too good, and all of a sudden he just runs out of the room. And sure enough, he's outside and, you know, vomiting in the roses. I was like, what in the world happened? And he said, well, I started to have an uncinate fit. So that as he's talking to the professor, the professor's breath just in <laughs> his imagination is getting worse and worse and worse to the point it literally made him want to throw up. Now, the professor's breath didn't change. There was nothing wrong with it. It's just that he had this hallucination of smell. Or one time we invited him to our house for Thanksgiving. And you know, the turkey's cooking, it smells really good inside. He comes in the door and he's immediately angry. He's like, I can't believe that you invited me to your house and you couldn't have the decency to clean the dog crap up out of your house. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, it stinks in here. Your dogs have just crapped everywhere. And I'm like, mm, no, that's the turkey you're smelling. So he thought it smelled like dog poop because he was having a hallucination of smell. Uh, uh, needless to say, we went out to eat that day because he just couldn't bring himself to eat it. Um, by the way, what we give to our patients when that happens is we give them a little phenobarbital, and it's a chemical that helps to calm the brain down so that they have less intense hallucinations. They're usually not quite as bad. That's uh, really quite important. Any questions so far? I don't understand, but uh, my niece and nephew, they were born with cleft lip and cleft palate. Sometimes they can't smell. Okay. And so when they eat, they just feel the texture of the food. Yes. And what seems like textures of like pizza, if that feels the same to another texture, they'll eat it. But how come they won't eat something new? Like they've gone to doctors, they said that it just doesn't taste, it doesn't feel the same. Right. So I told my, my cousin, 
to get food that smells like pizza. So that's what we did. And some, they won't eat it because it doesn't... The texture. The texture. Okay. So, when we're in the fetal stage of development, our skull and our skin on our skull develops kind of weird. So the bones of our face actually develop in half. So like your, this, the frontal bone here, that is a whole bone. But everything from here down develops in half. So that the bone of the nose, it fuses together. And you have two halves of it. The bone of your palate fuses together. You have two halves of it. And the skin on your face, including your lips, come together in this direction. So somebody who has a cleft palate also typically has like a cleft lip. And so what that means is the bone in the roof of their mouth, their palate, doesn't fuse all the way. It doesn't close up. There's a gap in between. And it could be a little gap or a really big gap. Usually the skin also gaps. So they'll have a cleft lip as well as a cleft palate. And they're born with this. We can do surgery, bring those bones together. But now this bone, okay, is, look, right here on this overhead. Here's the bone here. That's the nasal bone. And right here are all the olfactory receptors. So in order for these guys to work, when the nasal bone comes together, it has to come together in such a way that the olfactory neurons are hanging down. So if it doesn't fuse right, some of these neurons get caught or they get crushed and they just don't work and a person with a really bad cleft palate, cleft lip also has difficulties with the olfactory neurons. And so the brain is depending on the texture of the food to help it to know what the heck am I eating because it could be dangerous. And if we can't taste the danger, we've got to feel the danger. And that's what the brain is concerned about. Is this food going to be dangerous to me? And so it's only going to go for certain textures. And you know, some people have just fine olfactory neurons. They can smell just fine, but they will not eat certain foods if it has the wrong texture. If you don't like the feel of it, it doesn't matter what the taste is, you're still not going to eat it. So it can be the individual. It can be the way that things have formed. Um, okay, so we are going to talk about the eye now and vision. So the type of neurons that help us to perceive sight, these are called photoreceptors. Before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the eye so you have some ideas about the eye. First of all, on the outside of the eye, you have a thick covering. This thick covering also attaches to the inside of our eyelids on both the top and the bottom. So you can see this covering is attached to the eyelid folds around, forms this little pocket here, then goes over the surface of the eye, folds around again, forms another pocket with the eyelid. Now this is really important for you to realize that this covering is there. It's called the conjunctiva. So let's say you have somebody who is wearing contact lenses. Because of the conjunctiva, if you put a contact lens on the surface of your eye and it slips and starts to fall, it'll get caught in this pocket. It cannot fall behind your eyeball. And that's a really good thing because behind your eyeball is your brain and you don't want a contact lens on the brain. Or if you get a piece of dust or dirt in the eye, it's going to get caught on the conjunctiva. It cannot go behind the eye and end up on your brain. That would be really bad. So this covering is extremely important. Now sometimes you can get an infection in the conjunctiva, and they call it conjunctivitis, and that infection causes the eye to get really red, and it's super itchy, and of course you have to take some antibiotics, and it goes away. Now notice around the eye, there are also muscles here 
on the top, the bottom, on the sides of the eye helps us to be able to move the eyes back and forth, up and down, side to side. So these muscles obviously very important for movement of the eyeball. Now one of the other things is above the eye here we have what's called a lacrimal gland. Now lacrimation is to cry, so this is like a tear gland. And when we make tears, the tears come into the eye on the side of the eye, sweep across the eye, and then you have these very small openings right here on the eye. These are called puncta. And these openings, then the fluid goes through into the lacrimal sac, which ends up draining into the nose. Now this is also why if somebody's crying, they make more lacrimal fluid or more tears, which end up draining in the nose. So if somebody's crying, their nose starts running. Those are the tears coming out your nose also. Now the eye itself is made up of three separate layers. So if you look at the layers of the eye, we'll see what each of those layers are able to do for us. So we have the outer white of the eye. The white of the eye, of course, you can see somebody's white of the eye. This is called the sclera. The sclera is the white of the eye. And it is part of the outer layer of the eye. Also part of the outer layer, and it attaches to the sclera, is our cornea. So the cornea is under the conjunctiva on the front of the eye. So this is the cornea of the eye. It's directly attached to the sclera of the eye. Now when light enters into our eye, it's going to enter in through the cornea. Okay, our cornea is clear. Light can get in very easily through that cornea. It cannot get through the sclera. So light can't come in through the sides of your eye because the sclera is too thick. That also means that once light enters into the eye, it can't escape through the sclera either. So light is coming through the cornea, and then there's a hole right here. So this is what we're looking at. This is the pupil of the eye. The pupil is nothing but a hole, and around the pupil is what we call the iris of the eye. That's where the color is located. There are also muscles right here. These muscles help to constrict or dilate the pupil depending on what's going on. So if you're scared, if you're stressed out, if your sympathetic nervous system is working, your pupils will dilate so that you can see what's going on, run away from the lion that's chasing you, whatever it may be. Your parasympathetic nervous system will constrict the pupil, make it smaller. Remember, parasympathetic is all about resting and digesting. So if I want to take a nap, I want to constrict my pupil down so not as much light can get in my eye and I can rest better. It doesn't stimulate my brain as much, I can go to sleep. So the light goes right through this hole, that's all it is, it's just a hole in the middle of the iris of the eye. So again, the light is coming through the pupil, and go, or excuse me, through the cornea, it goes directly through the pupil, and the next thing it hits is the lens. Okay, so we'll talk about the lens in just a little bit. Uh, but then it goes through the eye, and this yellow layer here is the innermost layer of the eye. This inner layer is called the retina. The retina is where the neurons for vision are located. So light, again, it comes through the cornea, goes through the pupil, passes through the lens, back to the yellow layer, which is the retina of the eye, and then it hits the middle layer right here. The middle layer of the eye 
is what we call the choroid layer. This is also made up of pigment. What's pigment? Color. It's typically what people think of when we think of pigment, but in actuality, pigment is a chemical that absorbs light. So this metal layer has the ability to absorb light. Now that's really important because, okay, if you looked at this light, this white light, and you could take white light and you could shine it through what we call a prism. It's like a pyramid shaped piece of glass. If you could shine the white light through this prism, what would happen is on the other end, the light would separate into all the different colors of the rainbow. So if you could take a rainbow and squish all the colors down together, mix them all together really tight, it would turn into white light. When it rains, all that rain is like a prism and it separates the white light so you can see all the different colors. So when light comes into our eye, it's coming in like a rainbow. It's coming in with all the separate different colors. And eventually those colors are going to be absorbed into that pigment. Now, let's say that, uh, well, okay. So Joseph's wearing a red shirt. In his red shirt, he has pigment, red pigment. Now what red pigment does is it will absorb all the colors of the rainbow except red. So when the light hits his shirt, it absorbs all the colors except red. Red bounces back at your eye, you see red. If somebody was wearing like me, blue, okay, then I have blue pigment in my clothes and all of the colors of the rainbow when it hits my clothes are absorbed except blue. Blue bounces back at you, you see it as blue. If something is black, like this desktop, this pigment absorbs all the colors of the rainbow and nothing bounces back into our eye and our brain says, oh, well, if there's no light, I'm going to say it's a black color. Something that is white has no pigment in it. So no light is absorbed. All the light bounces back at you, all the different colors bounce back at once, and if you see all the colors of the rainbow hitting you all at the same time together, your brain goes, oh, that's white. This pigment we have in our eye, the choroid layer, is black. Now, light travels really, really fast. As a matter of fact, we say light travels at the speed of light, which is extremely quick. And so light, when it comes in, again, through the cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, to the back of the eye where the retina is located, it stimulates the neurons. And then we want it to hit this pigmented layer. And we want the pigmented layer, since it's black, to absorb all the light. And when it absorbs all the light, the light disappears. It's kind of like, think about the pigmented layer like this. You know, on the 15 freeway, when you're going down the 15, there are these turnout lanes that have these big mounds of dirt at the end of the turnout lane. So that if an 18-wheeler loses its brakes, it can pull out onto this turnout and hit that mound of dirt. What happens when it hits that mound of dirt? It stops it, right? What that dirt does is absorbs all the energy from that 18-wheeler moving without any brakes. It absorbs all the energy, it slows that 18-wheeler down until it stops. Pigment in our eye does the same thing. The light comes in like a runaway 18-wheeler and it hits that pigmented layer. It absorbs all the light until there's no energy. And if there's no energy, there is no light. And the light blinks out. But what if I had somebody who was born without so much pigment? They, they didn't have any pigment in the back of their eye. There's no choroid layer at all. Instead, no. Instead, what happens is when the light hits this retina here, it passes on to the sclera. And it will hit the sclera. 
Well, anytime light hits white, it bounces. So the light comes in, and instead of hitting the retina and stimulating the neurons so that we have vision, and then going into the pigmented layer and slowing down until it disappears, it hits the sclera and bounces. And when it bounces, it stimulates the retina over here, and then it'll bounce again, stimulate the retina over here, and bounce again, stimulate the retina again, and keep bouncing. And when it bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces, the brain gets multiple pictures instead of just it comes in and then goes away. And that bouncing, the brain gets very, very confused and doesn't know what the heck is going on. And we see this with people who have dyslexia. People with dyslexia don't have as much pigment. So that the picture that comes in has a tendency to bounce and flip upside down. I have a really good friend who has very severe dyslexia. And anything she writes is upside down and backwards. So that if you took, let's say she wrote a paper for class, you could take it and put it in the mirror and read it perfectly. Because she has no pigmented layer in her eye. And so the light bounces. Now the interesting thing is, if she wears sunglasses, now they have to, for whatever reason for her, they have to have a little red tint to them. If she wears those sunglasses, the sunglasses absorb most of the light before it ever hits her eye, and the light won't bounce, and she can write forward instead of backwards. Why is it they say that boys are colorblind? They aren't all colorblind. There's only a few that are colorblind. So we'll talk about that in a minute because colorblindness is really important. <coughs> I have a question about that, like with the sunglasses. I can't see off of the sunlight at all. Like when I go outside, it's really bright and it hurts my eyes really bad to look at anything out in the sun without wearing sunglasses. I don't know why that is. Because some people are just more sensitive that way. And especially the lighter the color of your eye, the less pigment you have in your eye. So if you have zero pigment in your eye, your eyes are super duper duper blue. The more pigment you have in your eye, the darker the color of your eye, which also correlates to how much of this choroid layer you have. So the lighter the color of the eye, the more intense the light is perceived because you don't have as much pigment. Okay. Now, there's also to the eye, in front of this lens, this region right here is what we call the anterior chamber. This whole region behind the lens is called the posterior chamber. And both of these chambers are really very important. So let's talk about the anterior chamber first. So this is the anterior chamber in front of the lens, and the pupil would be right here. Now this anterior chamber is filled with a fluid. The fluid in the anterior chamber is called the aqueous humor. Now, we make aqueous humor every single day. Not a lot. Maybe a drop or two of aqueous humor. And that aqueous humor comes into this anterior chamber, and every day a little tiny bit, a drop or two, of the aqueous humor goes out through this little teeny tiny canal here. Okay? This canal is called the scleral venous sinus. You need to know that. So this is the scleral venous sinus. This is the canal that drains a little bit, drop or two, of aqueous humor out of the anterior chamber every day. So we make a couple drops, we drain a couple drops. Now here's the weird thing. For some people, and usually this is very genetic, 
that canal, even though it's microscopic, you can't see it with the naked eye, that little teeny tiny microscopic canal starts to clog up. It gets a little bit of a clog in there. But even though it's microscopic, for many, many people, it clogs super duper slow. As a matter of fact, sometimes it may take 15 or 20 years for this little canal to fully clog. So what you need to know is since it clogs so slow, most people never notice it. And remember, we're still making a drop or two of that aqueous humor fluid every day. But the canal is clogging, which means not the same amount can drain out. So we start real slow building aqueous humor up in the anterior chamber. Now let's go back and look at the eye again. So this is the anterior chamber where the aqueous humor can build up. Now before I finish with that, let's talk about the posterior chamber just for a minute and then you'll know why this is bad. So in the posterior chamber there is also a fluid, but it's thick. Like the aqueous humor is more <coughs> like water. This posterior chamber, this is more like snot, okay, literally, it really looks like that. And so it's a real mucusy, thick fluid. And this fluid in the posterior chamber is called vitreous humor. So this is a thicker kind of gel that is produced in the posterior chamber. But this vitreous humor, it is made during the fetal stage of development, and you don't make any more the rest of your life. That's it. You make a certain amount, and you're done. Which also means your eyeballs, when you're born, are adult size. Which I always get a kick out of it when people go, oh, your baby has such big eyes. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. They're already adult eyes. That's why they're so big. You're done. <laughs> So you make this vitreous humor. Now here's what the important thing is. The vitreous humor, its job helps to keep the shape of your eye, but it also creates a force that pushes on the retina. And it holds the retina against the wall so it can't fall down. If anything happens to this vitreous humor and the retina falls down like this, you have what we refer to as a detached retina. And so you'll lose part of your sight because the retina literally falls down here and you have a vision problem. Now detached retinas can be fixed. You can actually push that retina back up against the wall and put some vitreous humor there to hold it. So it can be fixed if it happens, especially if the person gets into the doctors right away to have it fixed. If they wait for six months or a year, then part of the retina will just be destroyed over time. Question? Oh, you answered it. Oh, I did I? Okay. Okay, so now let's go back to the aqueous humor again. And in the anterior chamber, it's beginning to build up because this canal has clogged. So I start getting lots of fluid in the anterior chamber and a couple things happen. One, my eyes do start to bulge a little bit, but this fluid also starts to push backwards, and it starts to push on the vitreous humor, which then pushes on the retina, which has all our neurons for vision. And it squishes those neurons up against the hard wall or the sclera of the eye. And over 15, 20 years, I'm slowly squishing the neurons down until one day the person wakes up and goes, you know, those people moving out there, they sort of look like black trees. I really can't see them anymore. And now they have a disease we call glaucoma. Now what can happen is you can have the doctor go in with a laser and clean out this hole right here. They kind of laser it open and drain off the fluid. But 
if it's already compressed the neurons and destroyed them, you're done. We can't fix those at this time. And so the person has vision loss. So it's really important that you have your eyes checked for pressure. And you've probably, I mean, if you've gone to the optometrist any time in your life, they've probably done that little puff test, you know, squirt the air into your eye. I hate that thing. And what they're doing is when they puff that air into your eye, they're measuring how fast it bounces back. Because the harder your eye, the more fluid in your eye, the harder it bounces back. Or you might have had it where they numb your eye and then they like put a little gauge right on your eyeball and they measure pressure. You can't feel it because your eye is numb. They measure pressure at different angles of your eye to see if glaucoma is occurring. And by the way, it can occur in young people too. It's not just an old person's disease. If it runs in your family, Unfortunately, you're more likely to get it, so you want to, you know, keep having that tested probably yearly if you can. Okay, question. I know Bono from U2 has glaucoma. What, what's the purpose of the glasses to help with that? Is that to help with the vision? Because they're like that weird orangey... What's the point of those? Those are... They have that color to them because they're so thick and because of the curvature. It, it makes you think there's a certain color to it. But it, it's not really colored glass. It's just a thicker, certain curvature to help with his vision. So this is a picture looking at the retina of the eye. And you can see, okay, so this is a healthy retina. This is what a retina with glaucoma will look like. This is actually a rip in the retina of the eye. This is a tear from the excess pressure. And in this region, this is where all the neurons are dying. And then it will get larger and larger and larger and kind of spiral outward as the eye gets worse and worse. Any questions about this so far? Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is the lens of the eye. Okay. So the lens is just like for your camera lens. It helps for focusing. So you change your camera lens to focus the picture we can change the lens in our eye to help focus the picture. Now notice with this lens here, it has some what we would call ligaments holding it here and holding it on the other side. It's held to muscle. So what happens is when the muscle moves, it can pull the lens. It can stretch it way out or relax it. And as the lens changes shape, it helps us to focus on things close up or helps us to focus on things far away. Also, notice what they've done is cut this lens in half so you can see that there are layers to the lens. So when we're first born, the lens is much smaller. There's just this single area here. And kind of like a tree, as we grow older, we get more layers on our lens. So the older you get, the more layers you get. The more layers you get, the thicker your lens becomes, and two things happen. One, it's not as stretchy because it's so thick, okay? That's a problem. Because for you and I to see things up close, to read up close, we have to really be able to stretch that lens way out to focus up close. And as people get older, you can't stretch the lens as much. So your close-up vision isn't quite as good. You've got to kind of move things away to be able to see them better or get, you know, reading glasses because the lens is not stretchy. That vision that goes bad as you get older is called presbyopia. they call it old vision. And it's due to the fact the lens is not as stretchy. Now here's another problem if the lens becomes too thick. Light can't shine through it anymore. So you have a normal lens or with the light shining through and the pupil looks very black. So sitting right behind this opening is the lens. Now notice as the lens gets thicker, 
the light can't get through so it bounces back at you and you can see part of the lens. If the lens is super thick, you can see the lens right through the pupil. Okay? The lens should be see-through, but now it's thick and light can't get all the way through. This is what we call a cataract. So now if somebody gets a cataract, luckily that can be fixed. So what they do is they do a surgery and you're totally awake when this happens. They just give you some Valium and uh, they go through the cornea with this tube. It's very pinpoint. It looks like a needle. They go through the cornea and it's kind of like a hammer. It goes in and it punches the lens over and over and over again until it is in teeny tiny pieces. And then there's also like a little vacuum device at the end of this and it can vacuum up all those pieces. Then they go in again and they put in an artificial lens. So it used to be if somebody needed a new lens, they'd have a cadaver and they'd take the lens out of a dead person and then put that into the other person. But now we can make these lenses in the laboratory and they just basically put like uh, acrylic types of lenses in there that will last forever. And so curing cataracts, super duper easy, very quick surgery to put new lenses in both eyes, takes about 15 minutes and then you're done. And you go home and you have vision again. <clears throat> Any questions so far? So glaucoma is when the aqueous humor blocks the interior chamber? Yes. And then cataract is lens? Yes. Yes. That, do they do that for dogs too? Or? Yes. They can do that for animals, yes. Absolutely. So if your dog has a cataract, that is not a problem. Do you see spots? You can. Yes. Because you don't have perfect vision. Things get very cloudy and spotty. So, notice in this upper picture here, these lines are supposed to signify light coming into the eye. So they're coming in through the cornea, through this anterior chamber here, hitting the lens. And then the lens is able to change shape and focus the light. Now when it does that, what it does is it bends the light, literally causes the light to bend inward in both directions. And the light comes into pinpoint focus on the back of the eye. However, over our lifetime, some people's eyes change shape. And sometimes the eye gets longer, sometimes the eye gets shorter. So if the eye gets longer, notice what happens when the lens bends the light. It comes into pinpoint focus right here where the shape of the eye is supposed to be. But since the eye is longer, the light starts to spread out so that when it gets to the back of the eye, it's out of focus. This type of eye that gets longer over time causes nearsightedness. That means you can see up close, but you can't see far away. And we call this a myopic eye. If the person's eye shrinks up, then the lens cannot bend the light enough so that if it was to bend and you have the normal shape of the eye back here, notice the light is still spread out when it now hits this shorter eye. And so this is farsightedness. That means you can see far away, but you can't see close up. And this is a hyperopic eye. Yes? Um, so why is it, does that happen when like you put glasses on that are not your prescription and your eyes start to change so the same thing happens? Yes, because watch. So if I have a longer eye and I put some kind of shaped lens, which we call a prescription lens, in front of the eye, what it can do is the lens in front of the eye, just like the lens in the eye, has the ability to bend the light. And now the light comes to pinpoint focus in the back of the eye. So depending on what's wrong, myopic or hyperopic, you put different shaped lenses to help to bend the light into pinpoint focus into the back of the eye. So if I put glasses on that aren't meant for me, it can bend the light in such a different way that it doesn't end up on the back of my eye anymore. 
and so then I don't have good vision. Now the other thing that we can do nowadays too, obviously, is you can put contact lenses on the eye. It's just like putting glasses in front. The contact lenses have a certain shape and they help to bend the light. Or you can have LASIK surgery done. And what LASIK surgery does is it actually reshapes the outside of the cornea. So that the shape of the cornea, as well as the lens, now helps to bend the light so that it comes to pinpoint focus on the back of the eye, even if it's longer or shorter. Question? Do you prefer contact lenses or glasses? Do I prefer them? Yeah. I don't prefer either. That's why I had LASIK surgery done many, many years ago. Um, so does like, a similar thing happen when like, you wear colored contacts? Because people say that's bad for your eyes as well, to wear colored contacts. I don't know why that's bad. I've never heard that that's bad for your eyes. It just has color in it. It doesn't do anything as far as focusing is concerned. Oh. So I'm not sure that they are actually bad. The only problem with color contacts is our eyes require a lot of oxygen and the color contacts they are not as flow through so you don't get quite as much oxygen to the eye so you just can't wear them quite as long as you could with other kind of contacts. Oh, okay. That would be the only drawback I can think of for those. What if you have color prescription contacts? Same thing. You can wear them. They're not really going to harm the eye, but typically there's not as much oxygen able to get through because of the added color. So you're not supposed to wear them as many hours as you would a different kind of contact. Okay, so now in the retina of the eye, there are two different types of neurons that help us to see things. And when you look at these neurons, they have a really funky shape to them. Uh, the, this is an actual picture of these neurons. One of them kind of looks like a cone shape, and the other one looks like a long rod shape. And so these neurons in the eye are referred to as rods and cones. So these are the photoreceptors. receptors. We can taste salty, sweet, sour, bitter. In the eye, we have four different types of cones. We have cones. One type of cone helps us to see red light. Another helps us to see blue light. Another helps us to see green light. And the last one helps us to see, I can't spell, helps us to see yellow light. What are these colors? These are our primary colors. So if I want to see something that is purple, I use blue cones and red cones. If I want to see something that's orange, I might use red cones and yellow cones. So depending on which cones we use helps us to see different types of color. Now rods, we use these in dim light. And this is for night. Or peripheral vision. So rods are usually like in the outer corners of our vision, in our periphery. They help us to see peripheral vision. But they're also really good at helping us to see things at night. Here's the other thing about rods, we only see shades of gray. So rods don't allow us to see color. We get to see different shades of gray, which of course makes sense. You know, when it gets dark at nighttime, you can't see color because you're using rods. And rods only can see things in shades of gray. 
Now, what if you have a person who is born without green cones? They have no green cones. What do you think their vision is like? They can't see green, right? If you don't have any green cones, green helps us to see the color green. And if you don't have green cones, you can't see the color green. So what color do you think they see instead? Gray. Gray. They see anything that's green in shades of gray. What if they don't have red cones? They can't see red. So what color do they see red as? Gray. Gray. Exactly. So let me show you a picture. This would be somebody who is red, green, colorblind. They kind of sort of see green a little bit, but red really bad, and see all the shades of gray. That's what they're seeing. It's because they're born without certain cones. Or possibly they're born without as many of a certain type of cone, so they can't see things as well. And typically when we do colorblind testing, we do something like this, where you put a number in the middle and try to see, can you pick out that number? Can you see the number? Anybody not see a number in there? Okay, so nobody in here is green colorblind? That's probably pretty good, because what number do you see? 16, exactly. So now what happens when someone's colorblind, okay? So our DNA inside the nucleus of our cell has particular shapes to it. And most of the DNA has a shape that kind of looks like this, sort of two X's. And if we look at part of the DNA for a male, they have one of them that is shaped like this, so that it's an X that's basically missing the other leg. Okay? So this is what they call a Y, but really it's an X that's missing part of it. Okay? So for the development of cones, to be able to build cones in our body, we have information on this leg of the X. But notice with this X, that leg is gone. So the information to build cones in one of the parts of DNA for a male is not there. So that for some males, this information isn't quite enough, and some men don't make as many cones. That doesn't mean they're colorblind. They can see the colors, but they may not be able to see shades of certain colors as well. Okay? But what if we have a male who has a defect in the X and is born only with maybe part of the cone information and not all of it? They don't have any cone information here. Like in the female, they have information on both. In the male, they only have information partially on one. So what this means is some of the cones may not be made at all. So maybe green cones or red cones, and they're red, green, colorblind, they can't see those colors. It's easier for a male to be colorblind because they don't have that one leg of the X already. So they're already typically, not always, but typically missing some of the cones. For a female, she typically has both of those legs of the X, but there is a possibility that she could be missing parts of it. Now, the male gets the Y-shaped DNA from dad, okay? And then the X always comes from mom. In the female, both of these X's could come from mom and dad, which means for a woman to be completely colorblind, dad has to be partially missing, and mom has to be partially missing information to build cones. For a male, only mom has to be partially missing information. So we say this is an X-linked problem because it always comes with the X shape of the DNA. Mm -hmm. So is colorblindness a genetic disorder? Yes. It, ha it comes from mom oh. mostly, but in the case of a female, it has to come from mom and dad for her to be colorblind. So it's usually a little bit more difficult 
for the female to be colorblind than the male. Any questions? Okay. So when we're looking at something, the information from whatever we're looking at has to go to the occipital lobe of the brain. So this information crosses from one eye to the other side of the brain and then from this eye to the other side of the brain. Okay? So you could be looking at two different objects and getting two different pictures of information on the occipital lobe. Now, in the good old days when they first started doing brain studies, I don't know if I told you guys, but one of the things that they did was they took people's brains and they cut them in half. And they separated the two sides of the person's brain. And that was in hopes of stopping epilepsy. Now, we can't do things like that anymore nowadays because you can't experiment on humans. But back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, experimentation on humans was allowed, which I find kind of strange nowadays. But you have this area in the brain that helps the two sides of the brain to communicate with each other and hold the two sides of the brain together. And this area that holds the two sides of the brain together, I don't know if I told you about this last time, this is called the corpus callosum. Did we talk about this? Okay. So the corpus callosum helps to hold the two sides of the brain together. And then what it does is it also sends information back and forth, right, left side of the brain, so they can communicate with each other. So in the 1930s, they did these experiments on people to see if they could get rid of epilepsy, and they cut this corpus callosum. Now the two sides of the brain couldn't talk to each other. So in one of the um, experimental people that they did this in, uh, they showed the outcome. So they did this one thing where they sat the person down at a table, and in front of them they put this big black sheet, and they had the people put their hands through the sheet. And on the other side was a set of keys. So they had them pick up the keys in the right hand. Now, they're not able to see it, all they could do was feel it, and the two sides of the brain have been separated. They could have done this also if they had to have them close one eye, and they only looked at it with one eye and not the other. So now, it's not talking to both sides, because even though from the right eye it crosses to the left, and from the left eye it crosses to the right side of the brain, the brain is talking to each other on both sides, even though the eyes are crossing over. So when this person either looked at whatever the object was or felt the object in one hand, that meant that the information only went to the right side of the brain and could not cross over because there wasn't any combination between the two anymore. That corpus callosum had been cut. So when they asked the person, what is it that you're either looking at or you're holding, the person would say, I don't know what it's called. Okay, do you know what it does? Oh yeah, it unlocks doors, um, and how does it feel? Well, you know, it feels hard, and it's got serrated edges, and you know, it's cold. All right, can you put it in your other hand, or look at it with your other eye? All right, do you know what this is called? Yeah, it's keys. Do you know what it does? No. Do you know what it feels like? No. But you know its name, right? Yeah, keys. Okay, put it in the other hand. Can you tell me what it does? Yeah. Can you tell me what it feels like? Sure. Can you tell me the name? No. Because now the two sides of the brain are not communicating with each other. So this corpus callosum, obviously, very, very important because even if things are supposed to cross over, if you cut it, they can't. Big problem. Any questions? Is there any way to fix it if it's cut? Nope. Nope. That's why we don't cut it anymore. So no one Oh, and by the way, people still had epilepsy after they cut it. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Screw it up there. It's kind of like the same old witch trials. Oh, you're not a witch. Sorry, we killed you. We drowned. <laughs> Yeah, that, those were stupid things, weren't they? Like, okay, so how do we tell if they're not a witch? Well, if they drown, they weren't a witch. 
Like people are on the stake as a guy from Burning Man. They were rich. Right. All kind of like. You would think after the first five people, you would have thought. Nah, maybe it was, it was fun to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the sense of hearing. So let's start out talking about the anatomy of the ear. So there is an outer ear, a middle ear, and an inner ear. And we need to talk about each section. So the outer ear, this is what we call the pinna of the ear, okay? So this is the outer ear, this is your pinna. And what this pinna can do is it can collect sound. Sound obviously is traveling. And what sound is, is air moving in waves into your ear. So if somebody claps, they just sent air waves moving at you that your ear picked up, which is why if you grab a hold of the pinna and do this, you can pick up more air waves, you can hear more, which is why you know you watch animals' ears and they move around so that they can collect more sound waves, more air moving, and they can hear. Also, part of the outer ear is this canal here that helps to direct the air waves or the sound waves towards the middle ear. That canal is called the external auditory canal. It is also part of the outer ear. So the outer ear is made up of the pinna and the external auditory canal. The middle ear. It is separated from this external auditory canal by this very elastic membrane right here that we call the eardrum. Or it's also referred to as the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane is the eardrum. The tympanic membrane, uh, what is a tympany? Oh, it's a drum. It's a drum. So that's why we call this the tympanic membrane. This is like the head of the drum. It vibrates. When air hits it, it's able to vibrate. Now located behind the tympanic membrane are the three tiniest bones in the body. So there are three bones right here. These three bones are called the ossicles. These ossicles are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are the three smallest bones in the body, and they are located in the middle ear. When the tympanic membrane right here, this eardrum, vibrates back and forth from the air or the sound waves hitting it, these three bones hit on each other. So this is the malleus here. This is the incus in the middle. This is the stapes. Kind of looks like, um, what is it called? The, the thing you put, a stirrup. It's like a stirrup on a, a horse's saddle. And when this tympanic membrane vibrates back and forth, it hits these three bones, and this stirrup, or this stapes, pushes back and forth against the middle ear here. The middle ear, or excuse me, I shouldn't say middle, I meant to say inner. So the stapes pushes back and forth against the inner ear. The inner ear is where the neurons are located for sound. also 
called the cochlea because it kind of looks like a snail shell. And this is where the phonoreceptors are located. These are the neurons for sound. So sound waves come through this external auditory canal and hit the tympanic membrane. That makes our little ossicles move up and down and our stapes hits on our cochlea hitting the neurons or the phonoreceptors for sound. And while, while they're hit, it creates a noise that they perceive and your brain is able to pick up the sound. Now there's a couple things I want to show you here. There's a little tube right here. This tube is called the pharyngotympanic tube. It has actually a couple names. We call it the pharyngotympanic tube. Or it can be called the eustachian tube. This tube actually ends like in the back of our throat. So right about here along the jawline in the back of the throat is where this eustachian or this pharyngotympanic tube ends or begins. I don't know however you want to say it. And then it goes around the jawline into the ear. So like behind your ear, deep in, and then around the jawline here. So it opens up into the back of our mouth. So if you were, let's say, laying on your back, flat on your back, and you were drinking something while flat on your back, there is a possibility that that fluid could go up that tube into your middle ear, which does happen to babies when parents put the baby in a crib flat on their back and stick a bottle in their mouth. That fluid can go up that eustachian tube and into the middle ear. And this is a big problem because if fluid gets into this middle ear and builds up, remember there's something else in that fluid. Inside our mouth all the time, everybody has this, there's a whole bunch of bacteria and fungi that live there naturally. Maybe even a few viruses. And so if I'm drinking something, that normal amount of bacteria mixes with whatever I'm drinking. And if I'm doing this while I'm laying on my back, not only can that fluid get into my middle ear, but so can that bacteria, or so can those fungi. And now, while it's sitting in my middle ear, it can grow nice and dark and warm and moist, and I can get a middle ear infection. I get what's called otitis media. Now notice one other thing. Right here, there's also another little hole. This hole leads into the brain so that whatever fluid builds up in my middle ear here, there is potential for it to go onto my brain. So if I get a middle ear infection, if I get this otitis media, then that infection could also move on to the brain and I can die from this. And let's say you have a patient who maybe they're an adult, maybe they're a teenager, and maybe they have, you know, bad teeth. They're not taking care of their teeth. And they get an abscessed tooth. And now you've got tons of bacteria in the mouth, more than normal. And while they're sleeping, laying on the back, that bacteria is slowly oozing up the eustachian tube into the middle ear from that abscess. And over time, they get a middle ear infection from the abscess tooth. And then from that middle ear infection, they get an infection on the brain. I knew a young man that that happened to. He got an abscess tooth, turned into a middle ear infection, turned into an infection on the brain. And at 16 years of age, he was a vegetable for the rest of his life because nobody paid attention and took him to the doctors. So, from that infection originating where the, where the tooth is, mm -hmm. and it goes into the middle ear, is there going to be pain present? Absolutely. 
where, but it's going to start with the, in the tooth part, right? Yes, it'll start with the abscess, but then it'll go to an earache. And then from the earache, it goes on to the brain. Yeah. I have TMJ, and sometimes the jaw will get, like, it gets stuck. Right. Would that affect that tooth? Like, would it not would damage it? Not typically, no. No. That's also the tube, you know, when you're going up and down the hill, it pops. Yeah. That's also the tube. That eustachian tube does that popping thing. It helps to make sure there's not too much pressure in this middle ear. Because if the middle ear builds up too much pressure, it'll pop your eardrum. So you get too much pressure in there, or maybe you get pressure from a buildup of infection in there. It will also cause the eardrum to bulge out and pop. Now, here's the nice thing about the eardrum. If it pops, it'll grow back. Don't have to really worry about it. You just don't want it to pop too often. Because it's supposed to be real stretchy, real flexible, so it can vibrate back and forth so that you can hear. If the eardrum gets where it's popped and grown back and popped and grown back, it gets some scar tissue on it and it doesn't vibrate as well, you'll lose some of your hearing. Now, also, another problem is uh, using Q-tips, okay? Because if you're not careful, that Q-tip could go far enough in that it could also tear the tympanic membrane. Um, I worked with a guy, when I worked at Loma Linda several years ago, I worked with a guy who was just a kleptomaniac, man. He loved to steal things. And one of the things he would steal were these things that they are kind of like Q-tips. They're what we call applicators. So they have like a Q-tip end, but they have like a wood piece, a long wood piece on it. So at the end of it, it had like a little Q-tip. And he'd steal those instead of buying regular Q-tips. So he told me one day that he had these applicator things in his ears, and he's cleaning out his ears both at the same time. And as he's doing this, he remembers, oh, shoot, I have something outside i got to get. So he walks outside to go to his garage. He leaves those applicators in his ears. And he goes to lift up the garage door, and he gets about halfway up, and his forearms hit the long pieces of stick on the applicator, and it goes poof into his ears. Now, not only did he rip his eardrums, but he also pulverized his ossicles. He turned his malleus and incus and stapes basically into dust. Now watch. Not only cannot the sound waves hit the eardrum, but these ossicles aren't here to move. And if they don't push on the inner ear, the phonoreceptors in this cochlea here in the inner ear cannot perceive sound. So even though the airwaves are coming in, they don't have the ability to stimulate the inner ear. And he became completely deaf. Even though all the neurons for sound were working, he didn't have any way to turn them on so that he could hear anything. So I don't know if this really happens. I've seen a movie where um, a person got shot um, right next to their ear, mm -hmm. and then blood started coming out of the ear. Like, started coming out of the ear. Um, Are you asking? Can that happen? Yeah. Absolutely. But well, where's that blood coming from? Well, usually that's a sound wave. Again, it came into the ear, but it came in really powerful, and it ripped that tympanic membrane. And when that rips, you get some bleeding. So that's typically what happens. That's why you're supposed to wear covers. So how does congestion work in the ear? Is it like, when you get super congested, it also affects your ability to hear? Why right. is that? So when you're congested, again, most of it is dripping up through here. And you get congestion in here, and it pushes against that tympanic membrane. can't vibrate very well. There's mucus and stuff around the ossicles. They can't move very well. So you can't transmit the information to your phonoreceptors very well. So that's what the problem is. Also, have you ever heard your heart beating in your ears? That's because sitting very close to the ear is your jugular vein. And every time your heart beats, that jugular vein stretches. And that stretching can also stimulate your tympanic membrane, and you hear the vibration of the jugular vein as it's beating. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How come? Like, when I'm about to do something really bad, how come I can only hear my heartbeat? How come I can't hear my heartbeat any other time? 
Like, I know I'm going to do something bad, but I can hear my heartbeat. Why? Well, usually because when you mean something bad, it means something you're going to get in trouble for? Well, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> Not that you ever do that, I'm sure. Uh, but you're getting a little stressed out, and your blood pressure goes up, and that means there's greater force on this vein right here, and so now it starts to make your tympanic membrane vibrate. That's why. What part of the ear is affected by tinnitus? Okay, so tinnitus... This is ringing in the ear. And typically, tinnitus is something wrong with the phonoreceptors themselves. So there's something wrong with those neurons that they're picking up sound when they shouldn't be. So why is it that like a lot of musicians get it? Because like I have tinnitus. Because like, you've destroyed some of your phonoreceptors. They're not working right because you know all those brass horns that are constantly playing when they won't shut up. Yeah. Okay. They make such loud sounds that they cause destruction in some of the phonoreceptors and they don't pick up the right signal anymore. And they give you signal when there's no signal there. Okay. Now there's also another disease that goes along with tinnitus. It's called Meniere's disease. And Meniere's disease is tinnitus plus vertigo. What's vertigo? Dizziness. Now it's not from crystals in your ears. You already have crystals. It's they're damaged. So in our ear, we also control equilibrium. So there's two types of equilibrium. There's a type of equilibrium called static equilibrium. And then there's dynamic equilibrium. So right now, static equilibrium is going on for you because you're sitting in your chair and you're not really moving very much, but you're also not falling out of your chair. So you've got some static equilibrium. So static equilibrium happens when we're not doing very much movement. But dynamic equilibrium is going to happen if we're walking, standing, running, uh, doing some kind of movement. Okay. So with people who have Meniere's disease, something goes wrong with the equilibrium apparatus in our ears. And those people get vertigo. They don't have good equilibrium anymore. And then on top of it, they also have the ringing in the ears or the tinnitus. Now this vertigo can be so bad with Meniere's disease that if the person is laying down in bed and all they do is open their eyes, the room starts spinning. So that many people with many ears can't even get out of bed. And the only way to stop it is either it just goes away on its own, which nobody knows why it comes or how it goes, or you actually have to destroy the neurons in the brain that have to do with equilibrium. You have to actually surgically go in and cut them so that the many ears goes away. Now the other problem is when you cut those neurons, Sitting right next to them are the neurons for, for hearing, for sound. And there's no way you can just cut the neurons for equilibrium without cutting the neurons for sound. So to get rid of many ears, they don't have the dizziness anymore, but they also lose their hearing. And so a lot of people, they're more than happy to lose their hearing because that vertigo is so bad, they can't even get out of bed. And there's people who have had many ears for over a year before finally they're like, Cut the sound, I don't care. Just help me get out of bed. It's the worst thing ever. I literally don't come to come, come class sometimes because of vertigo, I can't function. You get many ears? Yeah, my mom has it. So, do you go up and down the hill very much? Not lately, but I used to. Okay. So, one of the things that they've found with people who have many ears, they seem to be people who have uh, changes in altitude a lot. So, for instance, pilots, they're very susceptible to getting many ears. So, you know, maybe they fly for Southwest or whatever, and they're up and down all the time. Or maybe long-distance truck drivers that are going up and down mountains a lot. They seem to get this many airs a lot, which is why I asked, do you go up and down the hill a lot? Because people who go up and down the hill have a higher tendency for many airs. 
Uh, why it happens if you go up and down the hill, nobody's really sure what those changes in altitude do to the neurons for equilibrium, but obviously it affects them. So you have to be really careful of that. Any other questions?